Good morning. What a beautiful day. We've been researching the life of David for things that are kind of common challenges. All people face them. And what we're looking for is information on uncommon responses to those common challenges. And today, I wish I had time to read all of the passages of Scripture that pertain to the history of what we're looking at. That would actually take probably all of our time together. So I'm going to read one passion that's kind of the end of the story, and then we'll fill in the blanks as we go along this morning. It's in 2 Samuel 18, and it says, Then the Cushite arrived and said, My lord the king, and this is King David, Hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose against you. The king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite replied, may the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and he wept. And as he went, he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. One of the most common experiences in human reality is pain and suffering. And there's not a shortage of religious voices that would indicate that if you would just simply make better choices, you could avoid pain and suffering. And I wish that were true. I wish that if you lived a perfect life, you could avoid all pain and suffering, except we actually have an example of someone who did live a perfect life, and his name was Jesus. And as far as I can tell, there was lots of pain and suffering that he had to endure. So the, the question is not so much how can we avoid pain and suffering, or eliminate it from our lives, but how can we process it in a way so that we actually can be transformed for the better? And I think that those are important things for us to think through. So this morning is actually a real risky conversation because by talking about the things that I'm going to talk about, we could open our hearts and minds to some relatively painful memories and that could uh, really have a significant impact on us. So I want to actually begin this morning with prayer. So Father, what I ask is that as we dare to open our hearts and our minds to you, that you would help us see that those seasons of pain are not for our destruction, but that you can actually strengthen and transform us in them, and that we would trust you enough to let you in today. In Jesus' name, amen. So scripture gives us some insight about suffering, and the first is this. Biblical, the Bible tells us suffering isn't just fate. It's not like you were destined to suffer uh, all of your life. Uh, it's, it's not about uh, some kind of, you're the most unlucky person in the world. And so uh, some people get all the good things, and you just got all the bad things. Now, I have to tell you that uh, pain and suffering is not equally distributed among all people. Um, there are some people who do seem to suffer more than others, but it is not because somehow fate has determined that that is your lot in life. And once we accept that position, we really lose a lot of hope for the future. Uh, the second thing Scripture reveals is that suffering isn't a moral judgment, that you are not the object of God's wrath because you've made a mistake. Um, it is true that there are things, consequences that we can bring into our lives by some of the choices that we have made. But it's astonishing how often when we are experiencing really painful things, we just assume that God is punishing us. And uh, so that, that is uh, not what Scripture teaches. And the third thing is that uh, suffering doesn't have to be fatal to us. Uh, we have seen just in the last week or so two famous people that, allowed their suffering to be fatal to them. And now they have passed that suffering on in a magnified way to their loved ones and to their friends. And I don't think that's what they intended to do, but it is what happened. This doesn't have to be the end of us, that there are things beyond the pain and suffering that we are currently going through. So when we look at David's life, we're going to see that when he gets to that last phrase, he, 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 you can hear the anguish. I wish to God I had died instead of Absalom. 
and he keeps saying Absalom's name, and he keeps referring to the relationship. This is my son. And you can hear the anguish of his soul as he cries out. You have to know some of the history as to how he got to this moment. And uh, back in the ancient world, uh, political leaders and kings like David would have had multiple wives and concubines. And, and so he had multiple children by multiple wives. The first son that he had, his name was Amnon. And Amnon was handsome and he was confident. He was everything you would want a royal to be. And uh, he had an infatuation for a half-sister of his. The, the father was David, but it was by a different mother. And the, the sister's name was Tamar. And he was, it really was not love, it was lust, but he wanted her. And so he just pined. He, he was one of those uh, people who just couldn't make life work if he didn't have the person that he wanted. And, and so his cousin gave him some advice. And the advice was, pretend to be sick. And then when David the king asked you, when your father asked you how you're doing, say, well, I'm not feeling well, but if Tamar came and prepared some food for me, I think that would make me feel better. And so he does this. He, he pretends to be sick. He tells his father. Father tells Tamar, well, go make a meal for him. And so she goes in, and he has her come into his bedroom to prepare the meal. And as she's preparing the meal, he tries to seduce her. And she resists his attempt to do that. And, and, and she even tells him, you know, we, we can ask our father for permission for this, but, but he would not be restrained, and he used his strength over her, and he raped her. And it was a devastating thing to occur to her and to everyone connected with her. And she did a really courageous thing. There's lots of people who struggle with this. She really did a really courageous thing. She actually told her father. And she told her brother, Absalom. And the Bible tells us that David was absolutely enraged about this. But he did nothing. And Absalom, who loved his sister Tamar, was so upset about this. He kept waiting day after day after day after day for his father to do something to correct this incredible injustice. And two years later, nothing has been done. Nothing. And so Absalom says, fine, I will take matters into my own hands. And he does. He arranges for a special feast to be taken uh, out of town and the king's sons are invited. And then his plan also is to get Amnon drunk at the feast. And while Amnon is drunk, Absalom will give a secret signal. And then there are people who will assassinate Amnon right where he sits at the table. And his plan was carried out flawlessly. And Amnon, the oldest son of David, is dead. And David is infuriated by this. And so he actually exiled Absalom. He had to leave the palace. He had to leave Jerusalem. He had to live someplace else. And that went on for over two years. And after that time, the Bible tells us that David actually longed to see his son again. And there was an intermediary that found a way to bring Absalom back. But when he brought him back, this is what David said about it. He said he can come back into town and he can be in the palace but he cannot see my face. And that was the strategy that he had coming back. Well, this is an unbelievable story. And this is the point I want you to see. Responding to suffering by sinning only makes it worse. Responding to suffering by sinning only makes it worse. When we go through enough pain in our lives, it's astonishing how often we think that we have the right to do something that's not right. Because the other person really deserves it. And, and maybe they've done the same thing. How will they feel when it happens to them? This is a horrible way to live. And this is exactly what is happening. So, so Absalom says, well, Amnon deserves death for this. And, and he has him killed. And so he responds to Amnon's, son, or Amnon's sin by sinning himself. And then David responds to Absalom's son by sinning. And so he loses his first son by the sin of murder. But he loses his second son by the sin of shunning. 
just removing him from his life as though he doesn't exist. And things just keep compiling. And you have to remember about Absalom is he is a plotter and a planner. He put together a plan for two years to take down his brother. What do you think he's going to do to his father? And he worked on it hard for four years. And he figured it out. And he had a plan that would win over the hearts of people that would remove his father from the front throne, that would give him complete control of the palace, and that would end up with the death of his father. And he carried it out brilliantly. He was one of those guys, very charismatic. Part of his plan was, by the way, Absalom was not only an incredibly handsome guy, he had incredible head of hair, which was very long, and of which he was very proud. Now, none of you would know anything about this, but I grew up in a, in a religious culture where men's hair uh, was not allowed to be long. And they would often refer to this story as the reason why, <laughs> because it didn't go so well for uh, Absalom. But uh, he was very proud of his mane, and he was very proud of his looks, and he would put together an entourage of impressive-looking young men, and he would go and stand by the city gate every single day, and as people would come in to make their appeals to the king for the injustice that was occurring in their lives, he would ask them on their way in, well, what are you seeing the king about today? And they would tell him, and, they, and he would say, oh, Man, I completely agree with you. Something should be done about that. But there is no one left in this administration that will listen to your complaints. I only wish I had some kind of authority where I could do something. There was another little trick that he used. and He was the king's son and liked to remind people of that. And when people would come, they would bow down to, to uh, uh, kneel before him or even to kiss his feet. And he would run over and he would pick them up and he would hug them and he would kiss them. And he would tell them, oh, you don't have to do that. We're, we're friends. And he stole the heart of people. And then he launched his revolt. And David got word of what was happening. He actually went into another town. There's a whole series of events that took place. And he winds up declaring himself as king. And David knows what's next. And he's got to flee for his life from the palace. He will not survive another day if he stays. This was Absalom's plan. Responding to suffering by sinning only makes things worse. So... It's difficult to calculate, you know, how our sins are going to affect us. But here's what I want you to know. David had three colossal failures in his life. The first was the colossal failure of adultery. He paid dearly for that. Then he had the colossal failure of murder to cover up that adultery. He paid dearly for that. But he had the colossal failure of unforgiveness towards his son, Absalom. And he had no way to calculate how devastating that would be to him. It cost him almost everything. We can't tell what unforgiveness is going to cost us. And so David is running for his life, and as he runs for his life, he's, he has to run to the wilderness. And as it turns out, David is very experienced in wilderness living. He's been here before. He spent a lot of time in the wilderness when King Saul was trying to kill him. And it's actually in the wilderness when he's not surrounded by all the trappings of the monarchy, and he's not surrounded by people who constantly tell him how good he is. When he's back in the wilderness, he actually gets in touch with himself and with God. And this is a turning point for David's life. What I want you to know is that suffering doesn't automatically pay, make people better. If it did, our world would be fixed by now. Sometimes it just makes people incredibly bitter. But suffering has the potential of making us better if we know how to process it. And David shows us how he, how he works this out. And the first thing he does is he embraces humility. So he's on his way out of town. He's got an entourage with him. He's going on a road, and there's a ridge above the road, and there's a guy by the name of Shimei. Everybody say that name. Shimei. Yes, Shimei sounds like a horse that would run in the Kentucky Derby, but Shimei, he hated David because he was part of the tribe from King Saul. He never liked David. And so he starts throwing and pelting David and his men with rocks, and he's throwing dirt on top of them, and he's calling him a murderer and cursing him. And one of David's mighty men says, just give me permission, and I will shut his mouth permanently. Because it is a well-known fact that a person cannot talk if they do not have a head. <laughs> That's what he wanted to do. And, and, and this is... This is the opportunity. I mean, you've been there, right? 
when you've endured suffering and now someone's even adding to it, don't you just want to retaliate? Don't you just want to vent? Don't you just want to rip them to shreds? And this is David's moment, and he does something else we're not prepared for. Even though the rant that is coming against him is being done in really unhealthy ways, he finds a seed of truth in it. And what he realizes is that my basic identity is not a royal monarch. My basic identity is that I am a sinner. And what I need more than justice today is mercy. And I will tell you, that is an astonishing realization when you are going through suffering. Because we can feel so justified when we are in so much pain. And he just... He says, you know what, I don't like what that guy is saying. I certainly don't like how that guy is saying it, but some of what he's saying, there's some truth in there, and I need to own that. And so he does, and David begins to be transformed by that. By the way, humility is not putting yourself down. It's not saying you are worthless. Humility is just owning all the truth about yourself. If you've ever been in a recovery program, one of the things you'll notice is that they will require you to, to take just an, a, a really challenging inventory of your life where you acknowledge the good and the bad, and you don't make excuses for it. That's humility. Humility is the recognition that you are not a perfect person and that you can't fix everything on your own, that you actually need help. And it is amazing. When you embrace humility, there's an entire world of wisdom that opens up to you. And it's not available until you are willing to humble yourself. So David embraced humility, but he also engages in prayer. This is a really significant part of his process of being able to get through this season of suffering. He had been betrayed by his son, but there was someone else who was an incredibly close friend and counselor of David, and his name was Ahithophel. I know it's not a common name anymore, but Ahithophel was one of David's closest allies and friends. In fact, he gave such wise counsel. He was so strategic and wise that David said speaking to him was like speaking to God. Ahithophel just had a way of taking confusing information and bringing clarity to it. He could see a path forward when everybody else felt stuck. He was an incredibly wise counselor. And David thought that because he had given him such wise counsel for all of these years that he was a close friend. But he actually wasn't loyal to David. He was loyal to himself. The reason that he gave such wise counsel to David was because that was his best interest to do so. And now David is off the throne. And... His son Absalom is on the throne, so he decides to give really wise counsel to Absalom. David has a huge double loss here. The first is that he lost someone he thought was a close ally and friend, and now his son actually has access to that person, and he's devastated by it. He actually wrote about this in Psalm 55. This is the message translation, but listen to how he talks about his experience with Ahithophel. This isn't a neighborhood bully mocking me. I could take that. This isn't a foreign devil spitting invective. I could, I could tune that out. It's you. We grew up together. You, my best friend. Those long hours of leisure where we walked arm in arm. God, a third party to our conversation. And this, my best friend, betrayed his best friends. His life betrayed his word. All my life, I've been charmed by his speech, never dreaming he'd turn on me. His words, which were music to my ears, turned to daggers in my heart. What's fascinating is that's part of a prayer that David is actually praying to God. He's re-engaging in conversations with God. He's not just looking for shortcuts anymore where he talks to people who he thinks can help figure the problem out. He's actually having a conversation with God, and they're brutally honest. And it's making a difference. This is what we need to understand. When you start talking to God again, something else begins to happen. Now, lots of people choose not to talk to God anymore once they're experiencing suffering. They give God the silent treatment because they blame him for everything that's happening in their lives. But there is another option. A season of suffering can open the door to some of the most honest and powerful prayers you have ever prayed in your life. And that has an incredibly transforming impact on us. 
the third thing that he does is he renews his compassion. The season of suffering enables him to embrace humility and engage in prayer and renew his compassion. So David had loyal soldiers with him. And what lots of people had forgotten by this time of his life is that he had been a seasoned warrior. He was the warrior king. And he was capable of developing incredibly brilliant military strategies. And he put his mind and his efforts to work on this. And he could spot every weakness in Absalom's effort. And he knew how to leverage what strength he had left. And he calculated it all out and he figured it out. And he knew it was going to change. When he was done, he would be back on the throne. So he gave very clear instructions to his soldiers. Listen to what he said to them. Be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. There's going to be war. It's going to be a civil war. There's going to be blood that flows in the streets. David is going back to the throne. But he tells his generals and his soldiers, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. This is fascinating when you realize the history here. This is the young man who is trying to kill you. This is the young man who has thrown you off the throne. There's even aspects to the story that I'm not bringing up this morning that are unbelievably provocative. Nothing had changed about what Absalom was wanting to do to David, but something was changing in David. And that's what makes the difference. He's recovering his love for his son. Humility and prayer can do things like that for us. However, David's general, Joab, he does not share the heart transformation that David is having. And so uh, Absalom is out, and he has a surprise confrontation with some of David's soldiers. And he wasn't prepared for it, expecting it. And he turned around, he was riding on a mule, and he had the mule running, and he was having it ride between trees because he wanted to avoid being seen, and he didn't want to have anybody with a clean uh, shot at him. And so he's running between the trees, and that, that beautiful mane of hair we talked about earlier, it actually got caught in the tree branches. And the mule just kept running right out from underneath him. And he is literally suspended between the heaven and the earth, and completely helpless and cannot get his hair untangled. And one of the soldiers sees this and goes back and reports to the general Joab. We, we found him and he's, he's trapped. He's, he's hanging by his hair from a tree. And the, Joab said, did you kill him? And, and he said, no, David told us not to. And Joab grabs three javelins and he rushes to the scene and he pierces the heart of, of uh, Absalom with all three of those javelins. And then they cut him down, and in a scene of unbelievable brutality, the soldiers just stand around and destroy that body until there's virtually nothing left of it. And that's how Absalom's life ends. Well, the reason Joab did that is because he thought that David's command to, to be gentle with his son was flowing out of sympathy, and that that was worthless. What he didn't understand is that that statement wasn't flowing out of sympathy from David or guilt. It was flowing out of a life-giving conviction. That there was a way forward. That we hadn't come to the end. Joab did not know that or believe that. A lot of people see Christianity the same way. They think that it's just some kind of sympathetic verbal garbage that's just poured out on people so that they at least feel a little bit better. But you don't have to read very much of Scripture to find out that's not what it is at all. Jesus understood the concepts and the power of the things that we've talked about this morning. And so when he was facing his own suffering, the Bible tells us that he humbled himself as a servant even to the point of death. That he asked his father that the cup would pass from him, but not what he wanted, but what his father wanted. And even in the face of unbelievable suffering, he breathes out the prayer, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. He humbled himself and he engages in prayer. And the result is, is that he's able to have thoughts about those who are present and about us that we would never have had about ourselves. What he knows is, is that he can make it possible for grace to flow freely to anyone who desires it. 
God is not like a hard-hearted general. His mercy is still great. His grace is still available. And freedom for our lives is one prayer away. So when we walk through a story like this, it's really wise for us to ask ourselves, what, what kind of lessons can I learn from all of this? And I think that's, that's the beginning point of wisdom. There are lessons to learn. There are things we can learn about ourselves, about the people who are around us, about the circumstances that we're in, about our strengths, about our weaknesses, about our, our value. But we have to ask ourselves really challenging questions. There are lessons to learn. And then what conversations do you need to have with God about these things? Because some of us just have blamed him and we've cut him out of the conversation. And that will not get us where we need to go. We have to include him in our conversations. And my last question that I would encourage you to ask is, who needs to see your face? Because David had said, Absalom will not see my face again, and he didn't. And part of the grief that David is going through after the death of Absalom is that he just wanted to see him one more time. Who needs to see your face? I can't promise the conversation will go well. I can promise that you will be stronger if you try. I can promise that something in the midst of the suffering starts making sense. I can't tell you everything gets better. I can tell you you will be stronger. I can tell you that God is with you. I can tell you that his hopes and dreams for your life are far better than anything you would have guessed for yourself. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, the risk of a story like this today is not that we don't see ourselves in it, but we see ourselves in it all too clearly. A lot of us could really identify with David today in being in a season of suffering where it feels like we're, we're on the run and we don't know if we'll survive. Some of us might even feel like we're connected with Absalom where we're an injustice has been done, and while we're do what we're doing is not appropriate, we've justified it because they deserve it. Would you help us today to not add to our suffering by sinning? Would you help us to embrace humility and take a, a long and clear look at our own lives? Would you help us to start conversations with you because you are the source of wisdom and our strength? Would you help us walk through this season of life so that our hearts are transformed because the only way we'll ever process the pain that we've known in our lives is for our hearts to be transformed. Renew our compassion. Renew our love. Renew us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.